Hello friends, <coughs> thank you for joining me today. This might be a, a brief broadcast, we'll find out. <laughs> Not that any of my broadcasts ever end up being brief, but anyway, some of them do. Hello, my name is Dan, my name is Dan. I'll let you see my face, for, that's a real treat. <laughs> for those of you who maybe don't know me, thanks for joining me. So. Um, just to, just to re-emphasize how bald my head is. Let's just put a bright light right on top of it. <laughs> hey, uh, for many years, four years, I did daily art adventures. Then my life changed. I'm no longer a full-time artist, although I'm still a serious practicing artist, but it's not full-time. It just dawns on me, you know what? It might be kind of fun to... Um, take you guys just for just for fun so I'm no longer a full-time artist um, it could be said that instead I'm a full-time uh, musician so I, I'm not going to play these at the moment but there's some by the way this is this is part of the reason why my wife jokingly says I play 50 instruments well I don't but if you play harmonica you have at least 12 and if you're like me, you have a couple low, minor key. So there's 19 instruments, get it? That's why. But uh, I practice all these pretty much every day. So I've gone from, there's a cello that's borrowed. I'm a brand, brand, brand new cello player. Uh, it's quite the experiment to see if I can, in fact, learn how to play the cello, practicing an average of maybe 10 minutes a day. Uh, likewise, French horn, I've been playing that now for about four months and I love it but as you know that's real closely related to my main instrument there's my my miniature pedal board by the way for my for guitar and microphone I have another pedal board that is roughly ten times that size I guess um, I'm also just learning to play the mandolin about two months on that it's been hanging on my wall for several years because it belongs to my oldest daughter but she never played it so I've learned it likewise well there's ukulele that doesn't really count but <laughs> I don't count it as an instrument oh yeah okay I do and uh, two saxophones I've uh, been playing the tenor sax for about off and on for two years really only seriously in the last six months and a soprano sax just bought that two months ago and so just started that two months ago um, here's been historically my main instruments are trumpet I used to be a trumpet head, that means practicing five or six hours a day when I was 18 years old. Flugelhorn, flute, and whistle. Here's the, other, the rest. Uh, Celtic whistles, penny whistles, uh, whistles, and, and recorders. So this slightly, slightly different instrument, but I don't count it as two separate. Well, sometimes I do. Then, of course, your normal phalanx of guitars. Uh, classical guitar, classical Elect classical electric guitar, Godin, Takamini, acoustic, Fender Strat, electric, and one more guitar over here just for what it's worth. It's, it's a Nashville high tuning, which I won't bother explaining. Anyway, I do, I do indeed. When I'm not doing, because I'm not painting so much these days, back when I was a full-time artist, um, my main job, my day job, of course, was to uh, paint or do artwork and my hobby was to practice and those two have kind of reversed now now it's my day job is to practice and um especially when my wife's not here like right now and my um and my hobby it's not really a hobby but anyway so those have reversed very unusual did not expect didn't did not see this coming didn't see this life change coming, but I'm very happy with it. Um, I've been a money-making artist most of my life, but uh, to tell, and I didn't tell you this back in the day, my first love has always been music. Um, back many years ago, you know, there was great debate whether I was going to grow up to be an artist or a musician. Um, I'll talk about that just for a minute more while I continue to mix up some paints and then we'll start talking about art. Can you not hear me? 
huh. I, I see people saying hello. According to my monitor, I'm coming through just fine. Somebody let me know. Aquaziwa, Aquaziwa, seems to speak as though I'm not here. And Stein, good to see you again, Stein. And Kaji, I don't know Kaji. Um, speak as though I'm absent. Um, somebody let me know. Can you, I'm not sure. You can hear me, right? My monitor says, my inner monitor hears you. Let me turn up the volume on, on this. Oh, sounds okay. Thank you, Uncle. Just another quick word about the music. Uh, if, if you were here for that quick rundown, um, you'll notice that, um, here, let me show you what I'm doing while I'm, while I'm talking. A number, the, the cello, the soprano sax, the mandolin, the French horn, they are all almost brand new. In, I'm, I'm, I'm beginner on each of those. That, some of you say that that's unusual. It is. It is indeed. I'm following my, uh, what, my heart. <laughs> I'm following my, uh, what seems to be my path. Um, I was a serious musician as a young person, but was almost all focused on trumpet. Trumpet and guitar. Classical guitar. So not, not, not like your uncle <laughs> Sorry, not like your uncle played. You know, most people play, when they say they get, play guitar, what they really mean is they sing and they accompany themselves on guitar. Well, I grew up in a culture, family full of musicians, so that is not at all what I mean. I meant classical guitar was my main focus. So, once again, the, the difference is practicing, practicing hard. Anyway, so I focused on that, and now you notice I'm, um, I've discovered late in life very late in life. Ah, no, I discovered 10 or 15 years ago. But um, I've discovered that I'm actually good um, at learning new instruments. So I'm, I'm just putting that, that realization into practice. And I don't have any pressure. Like if I don't play the cello, for instance, I may never play it in public. And that's fine. I'm going to give it a, going to give it the old college try, at you know, ten minutes a day, and I may never pay, play it in public. I think that's unlikely. I think it's likely that within two years, at which time I'll be pushing seventy years old. You understand? <laughs> I'll probably be good enough to play all the other instruments. I'm good enough to play in public now. Anyway, I, I digress just because I know some of you old timers wonder what in the world are you doing with your time. Well, that's it. All right, let's talk about portraits now, okay? Um, thank you, all you. All you clean the mirror. <laughs> the, mirror <laughs> the mirror is indeed spattered with paint, <laughs> literally. Uh, <laughs> I'll tell you what, let's just zoom in so you can't see the mirror. How about that? <laughs> all right, so uh, let's, let's start talking about artwork now. I entitled this broadcast uh, doing portraits the old-fashioned way, sort of. And what I mean is I'm doing it from a photograph, so that can't be the real old-fashioned. The real old-fashioned way is from life, no photos, right? Um, what I mean by the old-fashioned way, it, so far as it is the case, is I'm, I'm not using many tricks, or I'm, I'm really past, if you will, all the tricks. The only photomechanical trick that I use, this is my granddaughter, Tali. The only photomechanical trick that I used to paint her was uh, was creating a print on my printer upstairs, you know, my computer printer, plain old Hewlett Packard, blah, 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 and then laminated it. This is the only trick. So I made this the same size as this, not vice versa, by the way. I made this, after I started this, I made this to match that. That's one of my tricks. Okay, but after that, um, I guess I'll do it so you can see both of them maybe at the same time. Um, all I've been doing is measuring. That's the only trick. But I'm really past that now. And now I'm doing it the old-fashioned way, which is basically, and I want you to see, see me, which means basically, well, number one, sleep on it. <laughs> I keep thinking I'm completely finished with this portrait. You know the feeling? I, I've signed it. I keep thinking I'm finished. Then I come back, I come by the next day and go, hmm. You know what? So I did this exactly last night, even after I had worked on it some yesterday. 
without your company. Can you believe the nerve of some artists? <laughs> and um, I scratched my chin and went, Ooh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay, so that's what I mean by the old fashioned way. Sleep on it and just look. So I discovered, and every time you discover, let me, let me <laughs> at least me, I don't know about you, but every time I discover this, I go, man, what's wrong with my brain? I kind of kick myself and say, how come I didn't notice that earlier? And I'm sharing that with you because I just suspect that many of you have had the same exact experience. Why didn't I see that earlier? Well, the answer is because I was focused on something else. So there you go. So knock off the guilt thing. But here's one of the things I did notice uh, just last night. Let me find a brush to point with here. Um, the, the light hitting this part of her cheek, can I call that her dimple or her jowl right there? needs to I don't have that I have it but I don't have it bright enough right there also there's and I worked on this last night but I didn't push it far enough one of the things that I'm very cautious about because I I learned this the hard way and I learned it from um, Michael Carter Carter with a D I talk about him all the time because he's a very generous teacher very good painter portrait painter and very generous so that's why I learn a lot and you can learn a lot too you should um, one of the things I learned the hard way is the mistake of over contrasting exaggerating contrasts in a portrait I got to a point where I, I looked back at all my old portraits and went eek I did that on a lot of them and Michael Carter says that's the number one mistake so I believe him so I I think I've grown past that so, uh, but now maybe I've, maybe I've gone a little bit too far and I'm accidentally downplaying some of the contrast that ought to be there. Um, so this is one, I need to add a little bit of, oh good, that's still wet from last night. I need to add a little bit of light here and a little bit of, I know you guys can't even hardly see. Do you like that bad grammar? Let me pull this up. So you can, okay. Hang on, there's a little, see that crease right there? So it's light there, dark there, and a little line. I have it, but I don't like it. it uh, it's not quite right, so you need to fix that. Increase this, and then we'll see if there's anything else. So what I mean, and I'm working on some other portraits that I'll bring out here in a minute. Um, What I mean by the old-fashioned way is is just that. Basically, at this point, it's just a matter of it's just a matter of finger on chin. <laughs> it's just like hmm, hmm, that kind of thing. Okay, so that's what I mean by old-fashioned. And uh, so let's do a little bit. Oh, let me turn your attention for just a minute to um, my palettes, plural, because that, that required that that. Not requires that may you may benefit from a little explanation there. Hello, Luis. <laughs> Good to hear from you again. All right, I have two palettes here. This is my you regulars will recognize my normal palette. And I was, as you can tell, this is typical for me, by the way, when I'm working on portraits. This is how my palette ends up using. I use every color in the rainbow but it, it end, all ends up with m mostly flesh tones from green to blue to mustard yellow and then all the flesh tones pink and so on and so forth um, but all of this paint is fast drying because it has two things um, the white is um, is an alkyd that means fast dry oil paint see that word alkyd right there that means fast dry oil paint that's what's on this palette and the medium, there's a little pile of it right there, is liquid. Okay, so that's a, f I don't forgive me here while I get this in the, <laughs> there we go. You, you old timers recognize. So that's a fast dry medium. And um, this that I just mixed up a few minutes ago is a slow dry. So the little pile of medium right there is, again, this is review for all you old timers, is hang on neil Mag neil mcgill you're wondering how come i can't get this in front of the yeah, yeah. the strangely named 
Neo McGill, which for me it is a slow dry medium. All right, so, um, oh, why? Why does it matter? Why do I have fast dry and slow dry? The reason is the other portrait I'm working on, which I'll grab here, you know, which is this one right here, my cousin Jeff and his new wife, Marie. This is still in the fairly early rough stages. In fact, when I show you the pictures, the photo later, you go, ooh, that is rough. It's like, you can tell who it is, but you know, something a little wrong with her eyes, nose, mouth, chin, hair, that's something. You know, and again, I'm doing this sort of the old fashioned way too. Um, I could speed this process up by a number of tricks, but I'm not doing that other than measuring. All right. So this is fast dry paint, but after you get, let's go back to the little girl, my darling daughter-in-law, daughter-in-law, that's <laughs> funny, <laughs> Freudian weirdness. Um, my dear granddaughter, Tali, um, this has layers and layers and layers of work on it. And, and if you work on a painting over a period of days, you better switch from fast dry to slow dry. So that's why I have a separate palette for this painting. All right, whew, that took a long time to explain, didn't it? So let's talk then. I think I'm gonna pick this up because I don't wanna be able to look directly at it without reflection, without distortion. I think the first thing I'm going to mix up is um, the little shadow of her dimple right here. Oh, by the way, and many of you have seen this before, part of the reason for laminating it is so you can do a color check. So if I can see that mark, which I can, that means the color is not an exact match. Again, this is a Mark Carter trick. Much indebted to him for his excellent and generous teaching on YouTube. So let's try another. Nope, okay, needs more orange in it. So I'm just gonna pick up some, I don't even know what kind of orange. I might, I'm not stuck on any particular brand or color of orange. Sometimes it's even a CAD orange imitation that I use. Okay, so now let's wipe off the, the wrong colors and try it again. Have we zoomed in as far as possible? Pretty much. Ah, nope. Much too red. But I think if I add some yellow ochre to that. So all these other colors that I'm mixing up, of course, are not fast dry like just the white just the titanium white is alkyd all the others are just regular paint so so they're slow dry if you will and i'm mixing just a tiny bit of neo mcgilp neo mcgilp <laughs> again what a strange name anyway which it's a medium slow dry for me it's a slow dry. all right color testing again Getting closer, still need some more um, yellow in it. Picking up some yellow ochre. Sorry, I'm not pointing it at my palette. Let's try it now. Close, very close. You probably can't, you probably can't see that, which is a good. Thing other than the texture, maybe you can see that texture. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna kill the color a little bit. Does anybody remember what my favorite color killer is? It is raw umber, and I prefer a student grade raw umber. Oh, I think I just picked up too much right there. Does that ever happen to you? You're mixing, and then all of a sudden, you, your brush just picks up too much. Ah, <laughs> I did pick up too much. So the, the pile of paint that I'm mixing gets bigger and bigger. Do you know that feeling? You think you're the only one that does that? I 
trust you, trust me or not. And <laughs> you get, oh my goodness, you're getting a real a good example of what's the word? Reality. So now I've run out of uh, yellow ochre on my palette. So opened up the, my drawer, got grabbed the yellow ochre, put out more of that. In other words, just if you're an artist, exactly the kind of stuff that happens to you. <laughs> and I always fear that many of you beginners, early journey painters, you have these experiences and you feel like you, you, you imagine that good painters, if I can call myself that, <laughs> well, relatively good painters, don't have the same troubles that you have. It's good to, good to let you know that, oh, we do. You know, I've, I'm out often, over the years, I've, I've painted out on the street a lot. That was my main emphasis for many, many years. And I've had many non-artists come up to me you know, and they want to be friendly and chit chat, which is great. I want to be friendly and chit chat too. And they'll often, more often than I would think, they say, ah, yes, something like, like they want to connect with me, which is fine. There, I, that's, that's pretty much an exact match. All right. And they say, oh yeah, it's all about the mixing, right? It's all about the color mixing, right? And I always assume they must have had like an art class in high school and their teacher told them that, and that's one of the things you remember. It always kind of makes me scratch my head. <laughs> Sorry, because I kind of go, um, well, if very often I don't want to embarrass anybody, so I just smile and say, yeah. But of course, now I'm talking to you guys, I, I won't lie. <laughs> I don't know, no, it's not all about <laughs> mixing the color. That is just one, one, one little, little, I mean, I call it little. <laughs> All right, is that in the right place? That's the first question. Have I got that mark in the right place? Look at how I'm holding the brush with the, the dreaded death control grip, right? <sighs> I think that's right. Now, going back to my same slow, slow dry palette. Um, some of you, I believe, I blew past that really fast. Some of you might not understand. Why do you have to switch to slow dry? Because if you have slow drying paint underneath, did I say that right? Yeah, slow dry underneath and fast drying on top, the paint will crack, like majorly crack. Like crack, if you, if you, exact, if you do it enough. I have a painting up in my attic that I keep intending to show you guys, you daily art adventure people, and I never did. I'll get it out. Um, it has a, a painting that I did 20 plus years ago before I knew this. And, and the cracks in the paint are a quarter of an inch. They're like, they're Grand Canyons. They're a quarter of an inch thick. It's amazing. So I don't mean like tiny hairline cracks. When you look at a 19th century, a painting done in the 1800s, for instance, uh, and it has all these little hairline cracks, especially in the dark passages. That's exactly what, what the artist did wrong. Maybe other things as well, but. Okay, so, ooh, a little bit of a, catching a glow there. I like that. Now, generally speaking, again, Mark Carter-isms here, you don't want to blend your colors. You want to mix up different colors and put them down. So that's actually what I'm trying to do here. Instead of blending from one color to the next, I'm... Aha. Well, now, now I see a little correction in Tali's chin. Bear with me for just a minute while I mix up a dark something hang on um, this this corner of her chin if you will has with all the fiddling that I've done with it with all the work that I've done with it it's it's uh, it's creeped it's creeped out beyond 
what is what is realistic. So can you see it? I need to round off a little bit right there. And that's one of the parts of the paint that happens a lot too. That was correct earlier in the process, but then I've painted on this chin several times trying to get the values correct and it's just crept now. Let me hang on, hang on. I'm not sure that's right either. You know what? All right, I'm going to do some measuring. I said I was beyond the measuring stage, but evidently I'm not. Let me, let's double check this and I'll show you how I do that. This is good for those of you who missed. So this, this is a pair of dividers and I'm going to, I'm going to say that the, the top of her bottom lip, I'm going to say is, is accurate. And I'm going to go from there to the very farthest chin point of her chin. Her chin doesn't have a point, you understand, but the farthest away point, right about there. Okay, now it's quite, let me, let me get this straight. It's quite important, if I want to be accurate, that I keep this tool at the same exact angle, okay? Whoa! Whoa, 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 whoa. Well, my goodness, I'm glad I did that. So let's, let, it, my chin is too short. Let's do another one. Let's do from the bottom of her bottom lip to where her neck intersects with her chin. Let's check that. Ooh, now that one. Whew, that one, that one comes out correct. So I've got some kind of problem here. Let's go now from the middle of her bottom lip, which is an inexact point. There, let's check this. Ooh, yeah. So this little part of her chin right here, so I just, that's a great example, by the way. Were you with me just a minute ago? And I said, I rounded that off. Turns out that observation was incorrect. It, that's not what was wrong with it. So something else. The, let me get you on my face in here for just a second. Let that be a lesson to you. I talk about this quite a bit when I'm in my various portrait broadcasts. Um, when you're painting this way, that is, if you will, flying by the seat of your pants or just flying by observation, just looky, 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 copy, copy, right? Looky, looky. I say, for even for the artist, myself, 50% of the time when I finger on chin, go, hmm, I think this chin is too pointed. Half of the time, my guesses are wrong because very often, almost half the time, it's something else that is happening that is making me think it's wrong. That's exactly what happened to me right there. Okay? How much more when a non-artist like my wife or whoever, she, is, she makes free to crit critique my artwork, which is really good because it needs to be looked at by a non-artist. How much more when, like, some, like you, uh, if you're, I don't know, if you're not a great portrait painter, maybe you're better than me, you could see all my mistakes, but um, so what I, the point is, hold all your guesses loosely. In your mind, you say, well, I think, and, and I'll, be, I'll be doing that a lot here in just a few minutes when I'm working on this much rougher portrait, early stage portrait. Um, all right, so... Um, let me do some more measuring here. And I, oh good, hang on. I do have a clipboard here. I was gonna say this, having a, having a clipboard here. There we go. This allows me to, because there's something hard underneath it now that allows. So let me, let's re-measure that again. From the top of her bottom lip, right where her teeth break, to the point of her chin now is that. All right, it's very, very, very close. Um, I'm actually going to add a tiny bit of light. Uh, I need a little bit of yellow in that. So again, a little bit of that fresh uh, yellow ochre that I just put out a minute ago. Now, uh, one quick I don't know if you can see this on your monitor or not, but in my opinion, this photograph, as much as I fiddled with it, and I did fiddle with it, as much as I fiddled with it in Photoshop, I couldn't quite get the yellow cast, the yellow tint out of it. So I just 
let it go, and I have made that adjustment, which I don't like. I like matching it perfectly, but um, the, I couldn't get the print, again, messing in Photoshop. I couldn't get all the yellow out, so I just printed out what was, whoops, what was otherwise a pleasant, otherwise good flesh tone. But I don't know if you can see that this is less yellow than that. Um, let me make another comment about the way that I'm painting right now. Um, hmm. I know I'm right in your way, I'm sorry. I'm gonna move you a little bit so I'm not standing, blocking your view quite so much. Um, the way that I'm painting right now, um, in my opinion, highlights my, what should I call it, relative ineptitude <laughs> as a portrait painter. That's putting a little, that's a little bit too harsh. I don't want to be, don't want to be falsely humble. Um, Anyway, you can see where I'm at. I'm, I'm neither great nor terrible. Um, but I'm keenly aware of the fact that if I were a much better portrait painter, um, like John Singer Sargent and Christian um, Hook and a whole host of other people, Anders Zorn, Swedish, I think it was, Swedish contemporary of, um, of uh, John Singer Sargent. Um, if, if I was like them and, and a host of other, I mean, you will never find me probably, probably showing at the National Portrait, National Association of Portrait Painters or whatever it's called. I'm just not that good. Um, I'm not terribly ashamed of that because you can go to my website if you want, Dan Nelson Art. I'm actually working on it, by the way. In fact, I've been working on it a lot and then discovered that my old computer is just groaning under the weight of the, compute, the, the website app, the website program that builds a website. And so I ordered myself a new computer yesterday. So when it arrives, I'll go back to working on my Anyway, you can go to my website, Dan Nelson Art, and see a, a vast array, an extremely, ridiculously wide range of artwork that I've done in my life, and you'll get the impression that, oh, he's not just a port, he's not a full-time port. So, that, yes, correct. I am not, have never been a full-time portrait painter. And I can either be ashamed and embarrassed of that, which I'm not, or I can change careers and become a full-time portrait painter which I'm probably not going to do. Or I can just do the best I can, and that is what I'm doing, and reflecting in my, in my teaching you know, where I'm at in my journey. So what makes my portrait paintings not great, is just to let you see this up close for a minute, is basically the smoothness of them. I mean, this is a dead ringer. For, it, it's a beautiful portrait of my granddaughter, and I'm not embarrassed of it, but it is somewhat smooth, shall we say. And now I do have done in the course of my life, accidentally I've done some really nice portraits over the years. And uh, they are also on my website, you can see those. But they're almost an accident. It's like every once in a while I just, I nail one and I, I kind of look like a good portrait painter. And uh, by the way, I haven't, I'm not looking at your chats right now. Please understand, I am not begging for a compliment. Please don't say, oh Dan, you're pretty good. Ah, uh, thanks. Yeah, I appreciate that. But that, that really is not what I'm, I'm not begging for any kind of, okay, I'm not, anyway, never mind. That's enough, enough self-absorbed talk. Let's go on to other things. Um, ah, here's a good, good teaching moment because I'm, I'm using it right now, using this principle. Um, if you watch me at all and have watched me in my old Daily Art Adventures, one of my most oft-quoted mantras for painting is that you get dark with 
transparent colors and light with opaque colors. Okay, if you want some part of your painting to be darker than it is, you paint like a watercolorist. You apply transparent layers of a dark color, all right? There is one huge exception to that rule, and that is if you're painting portraits. Right now, I'm trying to make this little crease in her chin darker, and I am certainly not using, um, not using transparent paint. Why? Because that rule is too uh, garish, too hard, too blunt. It's too blunt of a tool for, uh, and this does not apply to watercolor portraits at all. Of course, everything in watercolors portrait is, is transparent. Anyway, so just for what it's worth, um, when you have, want, if I want this part of her chin slightly darker, I'm not mixing up a transparent glaze again because it's just too, too blunt of a tool. I think that's the best way to put it. Let's see, some of you chats here. Yes, Uncle, that is a great point. That is absolutely, Uncle says, if you make yourself happy with your artwork, is that good enough? Ding, 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 ding. Yes, that, that's actually the, the bottom line in several of my art classes, uh, my art book, <laughs> that I do hope to write more now that I'm not doing so much artwork. I hope to get my attention back to more writing. The book is called The Breakable Laws of Painting. Hope it's done before I die. I think it will be. Um, yes, if, if it makes you happy, that is good enough. Capital letters, bold face, underlined three times. If it makes you happy, that is good enough. And that is indeed where most artists, of course, live. That's, that's not, not many are really trying to pay their bills uh, with their artwork as I was for many years, and now I'm like you, I'm not. By the way, <laughs> um, good point. That's part of the reason why, <laughs> why I'm being, going so slow and being so fussy about this portrait is because um, I'm no longer uh, uh, under the pressure of uh, breakneck speed to pay the bills get it out the door so i can get the next one in so i can get the, it out the door so i can get the next one in that was has been was my life for most of 40 years um off and on intermixed with other careers related to being a musician again um yeah so even the fact that i'm able to go with slow and that i'm not quote unquote cheating or using photo mechanical tricks you might ask, well, what, what could be, what would be one of the photomechanical tricks you would use at this point? Um, one is, um, I would print this out again on paper and then tape it to the painting along one edge and flip the paper back and forth. I call it a flip book or a flip chart um, way of correcting. Another way would be to lay a piece of clear acetate, plastic uh, transparency on top of this. And with a very fine Sharpie marker or something, very carefully trace this and then take that piece of acetate and, and slap it down on my portrait and see if there's any lines. So I have not done anything like that, partly just because I wanna be because I have the time, right? So, because I'm not in a rush to pay the mortgage. I'm not being paid anything for this painting, of course, it's my granddaughter. Um, and partly just because I, I want to push myself. Uh, you've heard me say, some of you old timers, you've heard me say for years, some of you, that using those photomechanical tricks is absolutely legal. Go ahead and do it. Just understand that the more you rely on those tricks, the more your drawing skills deteriorate which of course if you're like me that gives you the puts of something scares the heebie-jeebies out of you so i don't like the idea of my skills deteriorating 
So that's part of the reason why I'm doing this the hard way. I just want to, whoops, I see something. Do you? Look at the color of her lip right there. Doggone, how did I do that? Look at how dark it is there. That's crazy. That's way off. Okay. That's one of those. That is one of those that makes you go, what is wrong with my brain? How come I didn't see that two weeks ago or whatever, right? Ah, uh, nice. <laughs> And again, I, part of the reason I even share all that kind of stuff is because I feel like probably many of you have had those same kind of thoughts and you beat yourself up and you think you're the one, only one. Let's test this color. Whoops, a little bit too light. Okay for the highlight, but many of you may think that you're the only one that has those kinds of self-recriminating moments and I assure you you are not in fact self-recrimination <laughs> is one of the things that us artists do best <laughs> hang on I just threw my monitor all the way across the room here <laughs> uh, are you there all right hey by the way here's a little commercial I'm not even being paid for this <laughs> Bobby Duke Arts. Do you watch Bobby Duke Arts? He advertises um, Raycon headphones. They are they are great. So typically, I just have one in the, on the ear that's that you're less likely to see. So I'm always wearing a monitor so that I can hear if something suddenly happens to my broadcast and my sound goes out. Which also means I have the joy of hearing myself repeat myself every word about a second and a half later. So you can imagine how exciting that is. <laughs> you think you get tired of hearing me talk. <laughs> you ought to be me. I get to, I get to hear myself three times in a row. That's a long story, never mind. <laughs> uh, I've wondered often, would this kind of delay in your ear, would it eventually make you a better public speaker? Would it keep you from saying, um, so much? It might. Evidently, though, it does nothing about ADD chasing rabbits or squirrels, as the case may be. And the other thing that needs to be fixed here is um, the boundary between her pink lip and flesh uh, brown skin. It needs to be much, much, much softer. See, it almost disappears right there. It's a very soft edge, and right now it's too hard. So we're gonna, we're, that's part of the repair project we have going here. And I'm assuming most of you know, it is indeed those little kinds of things, especially when added up, if there's more than one, those little tiny things really do impact um, a likeness. It, it, it impacts where, with it, you know, does this, does this look exactly like Tali? By the way, there are, are a few things um, that are different about the painting from the photo that I've decided to keep that I've resolved to um, I think I need to lower that chin still that I've decided to keep one is her eyes are just slightly uh, more defined a little bit bigger here in fact maybe yeah she's got kind of a greenish yellow ochre in there I probably need to increase that and then her teeth are a tiny bit whiter. Those are two things, those are two mistakes that early journey portrait painters often make. That is, they make the teeth too white and the whites of the eyes too white, partly because we call them the whites of the eyes, I'm convinced. So watch out for that. Again, the common mistake is making the eyes too white, the white of the eyes too white, and the teeth too white, and 
the reflection, the glimmer, the reflection in the, in the eyeball to light. Well, I'm going to put, put this aside here in just a minute because it's getting too finicky. Plus, oh, here, here, here's an important, I have taught about this many times over the years. I'm, I'm beginning to experience, uh, right now, here now, portrait blindness. After staring at your painting for not too many minutes, way less than the, than the time I've been staring at this, you become inured how about that you the the mistakes the errors that you have in the painting um, are invisible to you so that's part of the reason why again the age-old number one trick for getting a perfect likeness in a portrait is sleep on it work on it for a while come back and look at it with fresh eyes tomorrow and that works great unless unless as I was for many years unless you're in too much of a hurry or you're not being paid enough to take that much time that's why illustrators, for instance, have devised all these tricks for executing uh, a perfect likeness with great speed. You know, illustrators, freelance illustrators are the captains of cheating. I'm gonna measure one more thing before I quit here. And in a minute, I'm going to go to my other Portrait. I want to measure um, the, how far out. I'm not sure where best to do this from. I guess I'll start with the same. Okay, make sure that the photograph is vertical, like the painting. I'll hold this at the same angle. Oh yeah, well that, that comes out exactly right. Let's try the, let's make sure I've got enough of an indent. I think I do. Um, hmm, let's look at that again. Hmm, according to that measurement, I could cut this in just a tiny bit. Hmm. No, I could, but I'm not going to. But I am going to make one other change. I'm going to bring the round ball of her chin, if I can call it this, the ball, move it to the right about oh, less than a sixteenth of an inch. Also gave it just a little kiss of highlight, which I like. Back up to her lip now. So I've got a color on my, on my brush right now. It is slightly lighter than pretty much than anything that's on on the painting let me get more of that uh, I'm, I'm assuming you can see how soft this edge of her cheek is i want to keep it soft but i also want to clean it up straighten it up just a little bit that is very much important, and that's also a common mistake for an early journey portrait painter to make. Like in the photograph, it's essentially razor sharp. So the temptation is to make it razor sharp in the painting, and that would be a mistake. That's one of the places where your painting is to be better, of course, than the photograph. This is a child, child's face, it's soft. And a hard edge makes it feel hard. Duh, a soft edge makes it feel soft. Duh, it's just that simple. I'm still messing around with the highlight. That's better though, much better, much better than it was. All right, I'm gonna set that aside for now. I am happy with the little changes I just made on lovely Tolly's face. Um, so I'm about to show you uh, one of the best tricks I ever discovered for doing portraits. And that is, whenever possible, 
do more than one at a time. So I'm in fact doing three portraits. One, two, tally, three. This is not one portrait, you understand? Right, let that sink in. Non-artists sometimes have a, have a hard time with that. They think this is one portrait. <laughs> anyway, sorry, I'm being a smart aleck. No, that's two portraits, right? All right. And uh, here is the photograph. And I'm, I'm not going to keep broadcasting for a long time here, but um, do let me take just a minute to point out um, one of the photomechanical tricks that I have done. Once again, I printed this out I, after I started the painting. They widen up. So I did the painting. Um, no tricks, just look, paint, look, paint, look, paint, look, paint, right? And that's part of the reason why they ended up so high. I have a little problem here that I'm going to have to work out that his, the top of his, Jeff, is my cousin, first cousin once removed. His dad was my first cousin, um, and he's a dear friend, friend, family, family friend. And uh, so I'm going to work that out just by basically softening that. But anyway, um, so I, I paint first intuitively because I feel like that's important for me it, it's better to paint intuitively rather than to draw diagram lines on a blank canvas but that's just me so once I get started then after the fact I go back to Photoshop and print out as many copies as I need to till this size matches this okay so it's the opposite of what most people would think most people would think you print this and then make, paint this the same size not exactly i actually paint this because i'm intuitive I'm painting and then i make this and then i start making corrections all right and the photomechanical trick that i have done here that i did not do on tali i think you can see here i yeah with a sharpie marker i made these lines and almost doesn't matter where you put them I mean, it's eye level for him and chin level, but it doesn't hit her. It's just, just a box, top of the head, bottom of the chin. And again, it, it hardly matters. You can put them anywhere. The only thing that's important is that you are able to reproduce these line marks on the painting, on the canvas. Okay, so that means, yes, I'm literally with a, mostly with a black pencil, a little bit with a white pencil. I'm, I'm transferring... Um, these lines onto the portrait and then wh why does that help because then this gives me one two three four five six seven eight nine anchor points on nine on each face where I can it just gives me more option plus the diagonals like I I see the diagonal so I drew those lines on here but you'll see some of them have disappeared because I've painted over them. Usually one time will do, but in this particular case, I've actually redrawn those lines a couple of different times if I, if I lose them completely. So um, once again, that's, that's the only trick, if you will. I'm, for instance, I'm gonna redraw one line right now. Um, I can see, the, see it over here. Oh, I'm not sure I can see it over here. I'm gonna redraw this line for her chin very lightly. You guys probably can't even see that, which is fine with me. While I'm at it, I'm gonna go ahead and redraw the vertical line. So I'm drawing right on top of my portrait, right? Which in a way should give you the heebie-jeebies like, what, what are you doing? <laughs> Well, as you've already seen, don't worry, they will disappear quickly enough. Often, too quickly. So, as, as in this case, I'm redrawing them, and not for the first time. Okay, so that's a, a f I don't know, that's a moderate, I would call it a mid-level photomechanical trick. There, in other words, there are other things, like I mentioned, the tracing acetate, and then very carefully, very carefully, did I say that? tracing very precisely, picking up the plastic and laying it over here, and then you can see, oh, 
I have not done that here. Um, now there are a whole bunch of things wrong with both of these faces. I should be embarrassed, and frankly I am. Well, not too much. Um, but I, I, I can only see, focus on one thing at a time, pretty much. For, and the one that's bothering me the most right now is it looks to me like her top lip in my painting is like a curve like this. And yet in, in the photograph, on the test with a ruler. Oh yeah, oh wow. Oh wow. <laughs> okay, so that's driving me nuts. I'll fix that. Um, her eyes, it looks like this one's too big. Let's double check, let's just see. From the top of the bottom lid, you have to be very precise, you know, where you're measuring from, from to the top of her bottom lid to the crease. Oh yeah. All right, so there's two mistakes, quote unquote, two things that need to be fixed. Um, I'm gonna go upstairs and get a, one of my clear rulers with red lines on it, much better than this. But right now I wanna check the, the, the inclination of her, this eye, the angle. Now this is a little less pr precise. All I'm doing is holding the ruler no, that checks out, that checks out. About, there's something not right about that eye. And I thought it might be the angle, but that seems to be okay. Again, I'm just gonna show you some of the stuff. Okay, from the end of the tear duct to, let's say, to the outside of the crease. Ooh, that's good. <laughs> that is to say, oh, and here's another trick. Sometimes, um, when I'm making corrections like this, let me measure that again. And forgive me, I know my head's right in your way. When I'm making corrections like this, I will often make the correction in pencil. Why? So I can erase it? No! <laughs> I'm making the correction because I, I hope you can see that. Because the pencil mark shows up different than the paint, right? This is paint, paint, and pencil, paint, pencil. And it's easy to see on the canvas a pencil mark. So that alerts me that that mark right there is a correction. Does that make sense? Because I'm going to make a whole bunch of other corrections before I'm done. In fact, I think before I go on, I'm just going to go ahead and redraw her bottom lip, her top lip, the bottom of her top lip is what I mean to say. Let's just go ahead and do that right now. And then check the, the gap in her mouth. I think this line needs to come down. So there's another trick, and I'll, I'll, I'll let go of this broadcast here, probably at that point, the thickness of her bottom lip. Some of you perhaps can see with this operation that I'm doing right now, why I'm using a high quality stainless steel, you know, draftman's tool, instead of, it's upstairs, instead of the red plastic, um, proportional divider that y'all can buy at the art store. These points are sharp, really sharp, trust me. <laughs> no telling how many times I've poked myself with this dang thing. Hang, forgive my head again in your way. I'm checking the overall width of her mouth even though I've done that many times already. Yeah, that's right. Um, so this is a more precise tool because the red plastic thing, of course plastic just can't come to that precise of a Point. And some of you are saying, well, I don't think you should be measuring that specifically. You've lost all your freedom. Yeah, freedom schmeedom. What I'm after right now is a perfect likeness, not artsiness. All right, that's, that's me getting a little whatever. We'll just let it go with that. <laughs> I'm going to check the angle of the bottom of her nose now, which is a little bit abstract because, ooh, yeah, so this comes down. This nostril over here needs to come down a little bit. Um, so all of these pencil marks, of course, they will be all painted out, if you will. They'll be painted over. Actually, if 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 you or I, if neither you or I can see the pencil marks, um, at the, then who cares if they're really still visible or not? Do you follow me? But they, they'll be painted out easily enough. But 
this is really going to help. Now, in a little while, and I'll do the same thing to Jeff, my cousin. Um, let's check the distance between the two eyes. Yeah, that checks out. How about the distance between the two eyebrows? That checks out. Um, there's something not right about her forehead. I feel like it comes down too far. Ooh, it does. Good. Let me. I'm gonna make that check. I'm gonna make that correction right now because it's a big. It's a blunt change. So I've switched um, palettes now. Oh, and I've discovered that while I was messing around with that other painting, a lot of this, a lot of these fine piles of paint over here dried up. Like all my wonderful pre-mixed flesh tones, mostly dried up anyway. That's too, it's too light, too bright, but. I have found over the years, this, and this is a myst, still a mystery to me, uh, when I paint from a live model, which of course you don't have like this, you don't have hours and hours and hours, <laughs> typically, um, unless you're a real high-end portrait painter, um, you don't have time. But I find that I paint much more like a real painter when I'm painting from life, which is a, kind of a mystery to me. In other words, I, I paint more like John Singer Sargent. I paint more um, with more uh, energetic brush strokes. Probably just because I'm in a hurry, but I don't know. That is, I, I would say, is one of the downsides of painting from a photograph, is you do exactly the mistake that I'm making, which is you get too finicky, tight, precise copying the photograph. So I'm. I'm claiming, I'm pleading guilty to that accusation. That is exactly one of the primary mistakes that I make. Um, as you can probably imagine, all this talk, all this stuff I've been talking about, yeah, that's better, it looks a little more like her. Um, about John Singer Sargent, like, energetic brush strokes. Most of that kind of stuff, um, it's only us, we artists, who care about that very much. Um, most clients could give a flip and rip about whether you paint like John Singer Sargent. What they care about is, does it look like them? Yeah, right? Do you, you understand that? So in a way, all of that talk, even though I still believe it, even though I'd still like to paint like John Singer Sargent, for the most part, mostly, not, not entirely, there's some clients out there that are a little more, what, artistically savvy or something, but for the most part, most of them are not, don't care that much whether, they like the photographic effect, they like the perfectly smooth, I, I'm assuming you already know that, right? Let me check the color, yeah. All right, I'm going to wind up this broadcast. I'm going to leave you and now I'm driving myself crazy. Hang on, before I leave you, let's see if we can fix her mouth just a little bit. Now the gap between her teeth and her bottom lip is too wide, so I'm just smudging it in real quickly. Not tight, it's just loose. Now I've lost the gap between her teeth and... Once again, I'm using a pencil to indicate. Whew. This is driving me crazy. So there you go. <laughs> I'm gonna stop right there where it's driving me crazy, okay? <laughs> Thanks for joining me. I'm gonna stop painting for a while and I'm gonna go practice my instruments. I don't seem to be getting any chats here for a minute. Let's, let's see if I can... Uh, Turn that off and then turn back on and see if I've missed some of your chats. Nope. All right. Thanks for watching, y'all. Appreciate it.